when we think of the Overland Telegraph uh, and the staff who worked at its 11 repeater stations, each separated from the other by 250 kilometres of forbidding country, we tend to gain an impression of isolated individuals committed to a single task, receiving, transcribing and sending messages, a selfless, dedicated profession undertaken in isolation, dealing with the harsh environment and hostile natives. This impression was heightened even further by the attack on the Barrow Creek uh, Telegraph Station in 1874, in which two Telegraph Station officers were killed, uh, Stapleton and Franks. Charlotte Waters Telegraph Station, halfway between the peak and Alice Springs, just over the Northern Territory border, was as isolated as any of the 11 stations. And its long-serving uh, station master, Pat O'Byrne, dubbed the station Bleak House. Uh, and already through this literary reference, we become aware of another dimension to the OTL. Charles Todd had made sure that each telegraph station was equipped with a small library of books, including reference works and fiction, um, certainly including Dickens. Several of the stations had a billiard room and possibly a piano or a harmonium. I'm not so sure about that. Stapleton was playing the violin to staff on the veranda when the Barrow Creek station was attacked. In other words, the stations were small centres of conviviality. And this aspect must have loomed large for travellers up and down the line, including the Afghan cameleers, and for the staff themselves. My point in this paper is that while this aspect is entirely predictable, the stations in the central section of the line shared a particular form of collegiality which would manifest itself in a distinctive way. So this network of remote stations and their station masters um, would, would exert an effect on science and culture. When Stapleton lay dying at Barrow Creek on the 23rd of February, 1874, his wife in Adelaide was brought to the GPO where she was able to communicate with her husband by Morse code tapped out and transcribed by a young telegraphist who would go on to become the central figure in this network. This was Frank Gillen. Uh, and you can see him here seated in the, in the center um, with Aboriginal lads probably engaged at the station. Um, a few months later, and over here is Pat O'Byrne, who coined the phrase uh, bleak house. A few months later, after, after, this, um, after arriving in Central Australia, uh, sorry, after sending the, the messages, he, he set off to take a position at Charlotte Waters, living at bleak house for the next 15 years until he took up the station master's position at Alice Springs in 1891. During his decade there, he would win the trust of the Aranda people and would make the first fundamental breakthroughs in the understanding of Aboriginal religion. So he's shown here, seated at centre in this photograph of those living at Charlotte Waters in about 1880. Uh, Pat O'Byrne is seated at the right. The young man standing at left is um, uh, Jack Beasley. Uh, telegraphist. The picture is a fascinating one, not only for what it tells us about the integration of white and black in these remote stations once the phase of frontier confrontation and violence had eased to one of mutual curiosity and engagement, but also for the hint it gives us about the emergence of a network of shared interests. Women are conspicuous by their absence, of course, and in fact, no women were living at Charlotte Waters in this early period. 
Gillen was unmarried, but in 1890 he would marry Amelia Beasley, Jack Beasley's sister. Amelia was stepsister to Pat O'Byrne, which is extraordinary. Her father was John Beasley, the inspector of police in South Australia's far north. Amelia's first cousin was James Field, the telegraph station master at Tennant Creek. Um, now, you may not be able to see all the fine print here, but I've tried to do a colour coordination uh, so that uh, matching the stations, you see the, the different coloured text. And I shouldn't have used yellow, I realised. Uh, so that, that set of connections is laid out in this, in this slide. It may have meant little more than a loose familial link, but that link was reinforced by the line's capacity to connect across the empty spaces. In the first three decades of its operation, Todd had allowed telegraph staff to keep in touch with each other by sending Morse code memos at no charge. By 1900, this practice was finally stopped uh, to the dismay of the telegraph operators, but it must have contributed vitally to the sense of connection between those stations, already linked through family networks. Beyond that, while Gillen, Byrne, Field and Scott at Barrow Creek were well above the rank of linesmen, they also did travel up and down the line, visiting each other's stations and maintaining contact in that way. Importantly also, this fluidity of movement applied to Aboriginal people who had become, uh, who, who, who were um, using the stations as, as um, uh, centres of um, conviviality, you could say, in, in their own way, and access to European commodities. Uh, becoming familiar with the lion and its stations, and who in many cases had made the decision from move, to move um, from the bush to the lion, either temporarily or more permanently. The lion became a means of safe passage through unfamiliar country beyond tribal boundaries. Um, Gillen and others commented on the fact that this movement simply wouldn't have taken place in the ordinary course. So that young men in particular could travel up and down to visit extended kin, uh, join ceremonies and so on. We see this illustrated in the case of three precocious individuals, two from Tennant Creek and one from Charlotte Waters itself. The young Warramungu man, Dick Kubaji, whom I've written about elsewhere, met white people at Tennant Creek Telegraph Station during the early 1880s and was recruited as a guide by the explorer David Lindsay and went willingly to live in Adelaide for several years until his untimely death. During 1887 and 1888, he demonstrated uh, fire lighting and artifact making at the Adelaide and Melbourne International Exhibitions. Uh, track and Nat. Um, so there we see Dick Kubici, uh in his... Uh, uh, European clothes when he was a footman for David Lindsay in Adelaide. And there he is uh, as an authentic Aboriginal person <laughs> at the uh, international exhibitions. Track and Nat, um, the, uh, another Warramungu man uh, from uh, near Tennant Creek, became known early in the 20th century for his pencil sketches and his decorated shields combining traditional motifs with European figurative images. Jim Kite, um, or earlier Kilika, was a, a lower Aranda man, aged just 10 when Gillen arrived at Charlotte Waters. It's possible that he's actually in that photograph, I should have earlier. In his youth, he traveled north, possibly as an employee, as far as Barrow Creek, where he learned the Kaitich language. That background ensured his engagement as a guide and assistant on Spencer and Gillen's anthropological expedition along the telegraph line in 1901. During that journey, he showed his skill as an artist, diversifying later into small sculptural works carved from gypsum found near Charlotte Waters. 
uh, we have these in the, in the museum. There were these were examples of precocious young men, intensely curious about the new objects and phenomena which had entered their world. The telegraph stations offered them a pathway into European culture, and their artistic response to that opportunity has been celebrated in exhibitions and publications. Interestingly, that relative ease of Aboriginal movement up and down the central section of the line seems connected to the open communication and linkages between the staff of these central stations. And we don't see it so much in the northern section or the southern section. Of course, the central stations were no different to those in the north and the south where daily business was essentially the same. But very soon after the line was constructed and opened, another factor began to influence the outlook of station staff in the centre. The line was primarily, of course, a north-south conduit, but very quickly it became important to use the line as a means of exploring the desert country to the west and ideally to find a viable route to and from the Western Australian coast and Perth itself. Expeditions by Goss, Giles, Warburton and Forrest, who was successful in 1874, all took place within the next few years, and each of these expeditions used the line either as a destination or a fallback position. Station staff became exposed to the craft of exploration and became uh, slightly infected with its appeal, the sense of discovery and the specimens and the records being collected. And here it is worth mentioning that Charles Todd himself was affected by this curiosity. One of the treasures in the South Australian Museum collection is an Aboriginal axe which Todd received from the head of the Northern Section Construction Party, Richard Nucky. He had bartered for the axe with Aboriginal people uh, of the Newcastle Waters area who had dug up a telegraph pole and broken the cast iron footplate to make the axe blade which they hafted in traditional fashion with spinifex resin and wooden handle. Todd also responded to a call by Edward Kerr during the mid-1880s for examples of Aboriginal vocabularies uh, for his great work of synthesis containing more than 150 vocabularies across Australia. Todd recorded an Arabana vocabulary at the peak and was probably assisted there by the station master Christopher Giles, who had already sent a vocabulary to the missionary linguist George Taplin in 1879. And while Todd and several other of the telegraph operators in the central section uh, res perhaps responded to Kerr's request out of a sense of duty, Giles was already an enthusiastic linguist who later pursued studies in classical Greek and Hebrew. He collected plant specimens and sent these to the botanist Ferdinand von Muller. Uh, Gillen, uh, I, I believe, was heavily influenced by Christopher Giles. Um, he, uh, Giles probably assisted Gillen on his very first trip to the center in 1875, for Gillen collected vocabularies both at the peak and at Charlotte Waters. His vocabularies became the first known written records of Arabana and Lower Aranda, and he would go on to make vital language records with the Aranda at Alice Springs and produce the first comparative vocabularies in Northern Australia during his 1901-1902 expedition with Baldwin Spencer, and that's a, a page there from his uh, comparative vocabularies. This is his 1875 Lower Aranda uh, vocabulary, and this was his response to Kerr. Uh, and he is also wearing two-toned shoes. As I mentioned, uh, Frank Gillen married Amelia Beasley in 1890, just prior to his appointment as a telegraph station master at Alice Springs. A few weeks after his arrival there, in his capacity as a magistrate, Gillen took the remarkable step of arresting the centre's most senior policeman, W.H. Wilshire, for the murder of two suspected camel cattle spearers, Luritcher men, at Tempe Down Station. There is no doubt that this action, absolutely uh, justified, 
together with Gillen's strong reputation for fairness among the lower Aranda at Charlotte Waters, established a level of trust with the Aranda, which opened the way for Gillen and later Spencer to work closely with Aranda elders, recording mythological beliefs, social structure, and material culture. Um, it was the beginning of the fieldwork revolution in Australian anthropology. That level of trust is perhaps conveyed in these in images uh, of Aranda people at the Alice Springs Telegraph Station, where Gillen brought up his family and began making his remarkable records in photographs as well as manuscripts. And so we see the beginning of an important shift, stimulated by those external influences, the visits of exploration parties, the call for data on Aboriginal languages, requests for botanical specimens, etc. The telegraph station staff began to interrogate the country and the people surrounding them on their own account. Another triggering event was the expedition mounted along the line during early 19, 1891 by the governor of South Australia, Lord Kintore, and the South Australian Museum director, Edward Sterling. They were accompanied by a museum collector and a policeman and began their journey south by buggy and uh, wagon from Darwin, traveling from station to station along the line. And it was on this expedition that Gillen and the opportunities he represented for science and anthropology became known to the outside world. Sterling was deeply impressed by Gillen and it was through, uh, through Sterling that the Horn expedition, scientific expedition, um, was uh, organized um, during the following years, uh, finally taking place over a four month period in the McDonnell Ranges in 1894. Uh, four months in the field with side trips to Uluru and Lake Amadeus. It was the most intense examination by foremost scientists of Australia's arid interior. Importantly, the expedition did give credit to the Aranda people whose knowledge of the zoology and vegetation in particular enabled the party to collect a remarkable number of specimens in what were essentially drought conditions. So that um, these, are, these are some of the, um, some of the zoological specimens. And looking into these, I find that all of them were collected by Aboriginal uh, people for, for the scientists. Uh, as the historian John Mulvaney has noted, the Horn expedition had a transformative effect on the telegraph station staff. Gillen wrote to Spencer in December 1894 that, quote, every member of the staff at Alice Springs is anxious to contribute something to your collection. This was not confined to Alice Springs. Pat O'Byrne at Charlotte Waters continued to engage Aboriginal collectors to seek out zoological specimens for Spencer and for Sterling at the Adelaide Museum. Uh, these were women and children who traditionally had always hunted uh, small game and, 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 and knew about the habits of these creatures. Uh, Sterling was in a special beneficiary, being the first to scientifically describe the marsupial mole, Notorictes typhops, from specimens collected by Aboriginal people at Charlotte Waters. His later knighthood hinged partly on that discovery. James Field at Tennant Creek also provided specimens, as did Frank Scott at Barrow Creek. All these men were able to compare notes on their discoveries, and while the Aboriginal collectors may have not understood exactly how it was that their familiar creatures were now so appealing to Europeans. We have the sense of a common project bearing on the land itself. Gillen's exuberance and enthusiasm seemed to spread up and down the line. Sterling tapped that enthusiasm and his form letter to telegraph station operators and police seeking artifacts for the South Australian Museum before like Todd's acts, they were transformed by modernity, resulted in the most significant and wide-ranging collection of Central Australian material culture. The Overland Telegraph Line was an extraordinary and unprecedented infrastructure project, without doubt, but it was more than that. For a few decades at least, 
it became a line of inquiry, a means of generating knowledge about an unfamiliar and confronting landscape mediated by a small group of like-minded Europeans working with Aboriginal people whose knowledge and traditions opened up new fields of knowledge and science. Thanks. Just checking with the time clerk. Got one minute. What? Oh, here we go. Perfect. Someone want to uh, add or uh, raise something from that? Fascinating expansion of the idea of what the Overland Telegraph Line was about. I, I'm. My, uh, uh, is there one up there? Ah, yep. Somewhere here, there's one. Where you go? Oh. <laughs> okay. That's a tricky one. How many words were in the dictionary? I, there, wa there wasn't really a dictionary as such. It was, they were word lists. And Kerr sent out, uh, I forget how many, it was a pro forma, essentially. If you could find the words for water, uh, for the sun, the moon, parts of the body, artifacts, and so on. So um, these, there, there's, a, there's a lineage and there's a, a sort of a history of how these word lists evolved. Uh, the Royal Geographical Society had a, a, a recommended list of words that you could go out into the field and, and gather. And uh, th this was sort of predicated on the idea that it would be then possible to scan these words and, and look for similarities so that you could say that the the word for dingo might be the same as the Veda word for dog. In, you know, they, they were hypothetical examples. Um, I'm not even sure that that was a real example that I've just given you, but the, the idea of analogy and, and looking into the language in that way. This is well before the construction of detailed grammars, uh, which gave more of a contour to the language. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks very much. And please thank Philip, Philip Jones.